The Everglades Challenge is a 300 mile expedition style race um, for small craft. Um, everything non-power. So human power by paddling, um, sail power, and there are a bunch of different classes. Uh, but it's a 300 mile race. It starts in St. Pete at Fort DeSoto State Park and follows the intercoastal or near coastal um, down the coast of Florida, through the Everglades, across Florida Bay with a finish line of Key Largo. I'm Mike Dunlap from Barefoot Adventures and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the podcast today. We've got a former guest, Mike Dunlap. You might remember him. He attempted the Everglades Challenge on a paddleboard. It's a 300-mile race from Tampa all the way down to uh, Key Largo. An unforgiving, really tough environment. And uh, he's tried it another time since he was on the podcast. But this year, he tried it and he completed it. It's a huge accomplishment. To do that, only five people ever have done it on a paddleboard, and he is now one of that small group. So I wanted to have him back on to find out just exactly what it went on in this race, and more importantly, what he changed, what he changed f- to make you know turn su- turn failure into success, and that's exactly what we talked about a lot. And that advice can really be applied pretty much to anyone's life in pretty much any area. If you've got something that you want to accomplish, um, his experience is, is really valuable and uh, he had some really good advice. So here we go with Mike Dunlap talking about the Everglades Challenge. All right, Mike, what's going on, man? You are fresh. How are you, Tom? Uh, well, I'm. Long- looks like I'm doing better than you. You, uh, <laughs> uh, you, have, the, you have the look of a, of a high adventure accomplishment on your face yeah i'll I'll take this any day yeah well tell me Um, what you've been doing so uh since the last time we're on it's it's been a while yeah um actually i've two everglades challenges under my belt um one near finish and um this saturday i finished finished my first one entirety so right on that uh, is Ever- awesome why don't you explain what the everglades challenge is sure the everglades challenge is a 300 mile expedition style race um for small craft um everything non-power so human power by paddling um sail power and there are a bunch of different classes uh but it's a 300 mile race it starts in St. Pete at Fort DeSoto State Park and follows the intercoastal or near coastal um, down the coast of Florida, through the Everglades, across Florida Bay with a finish line of Key Largo. Wow. Um, Did you have in a-, a typical in a typical year? Um, there are usually a little bit over a hundred participants this year because of COVID it's been, uh, was a little bit less. It was 65. Um, and it's divided up into a bunch of different classes and with those classes, different speed boats. So you have anywhere between a stand up paddleboard, which I was on, you have, um, sea kayaks, surf skis, uh, expedition canoes, all with or without sail. You have mono hull sailboats and then multi hull sailboats. So catamarans that are lightning quick and 25 miles an hour. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, wow. It's pretty cool. What's a surf and ski? When, uh, it's a real narrow kayak. Um, and so it's how it divides how they differentiate between a kayak and a canoe or a kayak and a surf ski. It's a length to width ratio. Okay. Um, 
so they're they're meant for for speed maybe not the most ideal for carrying gear um this is a i've mentioned an expedition style race so if you want it you got to bring it with you mm. um so that means all your food your water you can replenish at different spots but camping gear safety gear um shelter the whole nine yards so roughly for me once you include the water into it it's usually about 60 to maybe 70 pounds worth wow. of gear <laughs> wow. so that's so awesome the 300 miles isn't enough you got to also carry all that gear did you have a a, a map of that of, of, where, where, of the race like is that what you pulled up before we even started was a map yeah yeah stand by so here is my completed tracker map All right. um so, so, so right much. there you're starting just a little north of st petersburg and you're going across a big bay right away is that what you do right so this year is a a little bit different um as was last year the intended starting position is Fort DeSoto State Park, and that launches you directly into uh, Tampa Bay. And the downside is if the winds are up, meaning a small craft advisory or risk of a small craft advisory, they can put a weather hold on. Mm and which would delay your start. And so then you're set up on the beach, you're milling around, you're waiting for the wind to drop just to get a window to cross Florida Bay, or I'm sorry, uh, Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. This year and last year, they also did a, a plan B start for the smaller craft. So the smaller vessels that don't have quite the same setup, they can pack up their gear um, and find an alternative launch site on the other side of Tampa Bay. Some of the, the bigger sailboats, and the, the ones that have a lot more rigging to set up, it becomes a huge hassle for them. And they'd much rather risk a weather hold and sit and wait than have to break everything down and then set everything else up mm. at a different site. Yeah. Uh, so this year with the winds race morning at seven o'clock when it's supposed to start, uh, the winds were blowing 18 knots, uh, out of the Northeast, which is pretty much a straight shot out of Tampa Bay. And it made for some pretty miserable conditions. Uh, since you are from that beach, your track is due south 180 degrees from that beach and that's to get into sarasota bay um so they offered a plan b start and i took it mm. um as did i would i believe it was more than half the field did a plan b start and that's just a matter of finding a a different spot to launch on the other side of tampa bay and they give a whole lot of flexibility. Um, so anywhere from say Sarasota all the way down to Boca Grand. Mm. Um, so you have to be North of Boca Grand to launch. Um, I didn't want to, to cut that much off the course. Um, so I found a site in Sarasota, uh, a public launch that was easy. I used it last year and it, it did shave off a little bit of the, the total length, but rather than beat myself up for the first 10 miles for the crossing and, and then be licking my wounds for the next 290 miles and potentially ruin my race, I opted for that plan B start. And so launched that morning. I launched a little bit later than seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Um, which in my mind kind of made up a little bit um, for those that did choose to start from the main start beach. 
So yes, I started further down the course, but I also gave myself a time penalty. Gotcha. I don't know if that was smart or dumb or what, right. but hey. Well, you know, I mean, it is it is what it is. You you got to deal with the weather. So lucky you weren't going the week before. I mean, that weather the week before was horrendous, right? Um, I don't know how much worse the winds could have gotten. Uh, every every day the forecast for the winds were 15 to 20. Yeah. But, um, but the week before we were shooting and uh, we, we cut a couple of days off the end of the shoot because it was blowing uh, gust into 35 and more. And it was, it was really windy. I mean, it has been really windy lately. So um, if you have like a, you know, an East wind, I guess you'd be okay because you're, you're going to be on the, you know, in the shelter Right. Oh yeah. Look at that. Yeah. That's the first day, uh, where it's gusting 26, 28. Yeah. That was the forecast for, uh, the Monday. And we started on the sixth. We started on that Saturday. Okay. Um, but this is just one of the screenshots that I, I kept, but 15 gusting to close to 30 at, at times. Yeah. Um, and cold fronts moving through. So it was, uh, it was exciting at wow. times. Well, let's talk about um, like how you plan this because it's a it's a really big race. You're basically unsupported. You get some you get some support from water, right? But you uh, other than that, you're you're not supported, correct? Right. So a whole lot of planning goes into it, um, and from a just your vessel standpoint. Now, I my vessel is pretty simple and straightforward. It's a paddleboard. Um, it's custom. I built it in my garage, um, so I became the first person ever to finish the race on a home-built paddleboard. All right, right, huh? Um, That's cool. So, yeah, that was a uh, an additional part of my challenge. Uh, and I had friends who have completed it. They're like, just just buy buy a board, buy a board. Why deal with the the hassle? And uh, I thought this would be the most green roots. So would, would your board, I mean, like you've been building boards for a while. I mean, this isn't your first one you've ever built, right? Uh, this is probably my fourth. Okay. So you built four boards. Would a, would a store-bought board or a, or a, a factory board be that much better than what you turn out in your garage? I don't know. I've never paddled, uh, <laughs> an unlimited length store-bought paddle board. Okay. Um, but your I'd, friends seem to think that it would be right. Yeah. So what did they what did they think was going to be wrong with your board? Just the the hassles and oh the ha- the the first time I attempted it, uh, the board that I built, it looked great, it performed fairly well, uh, but it definitely had its drawbacks. Um, so the second rendition, um, the big red, I'll pull a picture up of that. Um, So that's uh, it's 18 feet long. It's 26 and a half inches wide, and it's got a whole lot of. It, it's built with this in mind um, for carrying gear. So it's got a a lot of flotation to it, um, a lot of volume up in the nose to carry carry bags and then punch through some some of the bigger waves that I would encounter. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Look at that big old, and you carry your stuff, you're carrying your stuff in the front and in the back. Right. So balanced out, um, it, it actually worked out well. So Um, when you go to build something like that, is there some sort of plan or are you just kind of making it the way that you think it should be made? Uh, there was a whole lot of wing in it. Really? Um, (laughs) There's not like a template, like you could, you could pretty much go to the internet and find a template to build anything. I would imagine that this is (laughs) something that would be out there. Um, A lot of the shapes and styles, it it was kind of a morph between probably two or three different boards um, in the 14 foot range. So a typical race board, but beefed up. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my big influences uh, is 
a flying fish board company. They make a, a, a board. I have a 14 foot version of what I was trying to stretch out to 18 feet. Um, because length on waterline disperses that weight and a little bit faster. So that's why when you see like those rowing canoes, yeah, they're super narrow, but super long. Right. Um, and they can get up some speed. So I didn't want to go too wide because I wanted stability over speed because of such mixed conditions. Um, but I also didn't want to go too wide and sacrifice any potential speed. So, yeah. so is that a rudder on the back of it? Um, what you see there, that's my backup rudder. Um, that's a leftover from last year that I decided to keep on there as my, as my backup in case something went wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's kind of unique. I don't know if I have any pictures on here, but I developed a, instead of a fixed fin on the bottom, like you would on a surfboard, mm -hmm. I had that last year and I used that rudder and the downside is they were a little bit too close to each other. So the fixed fin wanted to keep going straight mm -hmm. and I would steer the rudder and that would want to turn while well, they worked against each other. And my speed would drop significantly. Like I would lose about one mile an hour, mm. but when you're only doing four miles an hour, that's kind of a big yeah. deal. <laughs> um, so I came up with an idea um, put my engineering cap on and I'm by no means an engineer or anything. I'm more of a MacGyver type, uh, just figure it out, make it work. And my fixed fin became my rudder. Mm. So I don't have a fixed fin per se on the bottom of this board, that rudder on the bottom pivots. Okay. And can that you operate works. that with your feet or what? I have two lines that run forward. And they go into jam cleats. Oh, so gotcha. it's it's a passive steering. Once you set it, you set it and forget it. And the idea was if I'm crossing a a bay with a wind on my side and it's two or three miles, um, may take me an hour to get across, depending on the wind strength, I can correct the pressure from the wind on that side and be able to paddle on both sides of the board. I see. As opposed to having a fixed fin, if the wind's hitting you on the left, you're stuck paddling on the right mm -hmm. for the duration. Uh, and it works phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. So what about, um, like when you're getting ready for this, what about your sleeping arrangements? I mean, first of all, how much are you sleeping? Then what, how are you, how do you do that? Well, I had, I had somebody ask me, they're like, well, what do you do for sleep? Did you sleep? Yeah. And I said, well, define sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so you have your, you have your board. Um, and then you are required to carry a whole bunch of different equipment on there. And part of that is a sleep system. Uh, the previous two challenges I thought it'd be good to go minimalistic and I went with a hammock. Mm. The downside is if you don't have anything to tie a hammock to, <laughs> it's a ground cloth. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this year I changed it up uh, and I found a, a one person tent, super simple to set up, super efficient, super comfortable, packed down super small and and it was perfect. Uh, it was just a, a hike and bike Yosemite one person tent, not super expensive, knowing that it has a potential to get trashed. Um, don't really want to spend four or $500 mm -hmm. on a top end hiking tent, but this worked out perfect. Um, and over the seven nights of the challenge, I think I slept in it three times. Hmm. one, two, four times. So I did sleep in it four times. And you're um, able to get out of the water and on something on, on the ground or on a platform of some sort. Right. And so if, if you find a place to camp, 
that that was it. And if you were going to be there long enough, um, you, it was a kind of uh, a balancing act of how much do you rest versus how much do you push? Mm-hmm. Um, and all the, the route planning and how much I wanted to cover in a day, um, I had planned out. And in there was a little bit of wiggle room for eating, sleeping, resting, maybe planning with changes in the weather. Um, and so essentially I broke the race down into 45 mile segments Hmm. and that's what you thought you could do a day, 45 miles, 45 was a good chunk. Um, and instead of going for time, because the variable is what the weather's like right? and what speed I'm able to, to carry on over those hours. So if I'm doing three miles an hour, which isn't terrible, ideally I'd like to be going four miles an hour. Um, but three miles an hour, that's 15 hours of paddling. That's nine hours where I'm not paddling. Um, and that's how, how I approached each day. Hmm. Some days that three miles an hour would, I, I wish I could have been going three miles an hour. Wow. Uh, paddling into a 20 mile headwind for 10 miles you're not getting three miles an hour. No, you're happy for a mile, mile and a half an hour. Wow. And so, um, you're, you're, you're paddling 15 hours a day for how many days? Seven days, seven days. Wow. Like that is, <laughs> yeah, it, that is insane. It, what are you eating? Well, that's, that's the other component. Um, knowing that I'm going to be in a, the caloric deficit, there's no way I'd be able to replace those calories. So you're, you're eating along the way for energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would start my day with one of those insure mm-hmm. type meals, replacement shakes. Right. So I'd kick the day off with 550 calories. Um, I had overnight oats that I had, what I threw in a bag, threw some water in it. And then when I was ready to eat it, it was there. Mm -hmm. That was another 550 calories. Um, I found some meal replacement bars, metrics bars that were 650 calories. So, and and I didn't want to go all sugar and that because of the you're going to crash from it. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for something a little bit more balanced. Um, yeah, the sugar and the goo type, um, energy shots, gels. those had their, their place and Mm -hmm. they were in there as well. But I also had some nuts and dried fruit and stuff like that. Just, just to keep going. Now we did splurge on, uh, uh, one evening when we got into Marco Island, it's kind of a tradition. There's a waterfront bar. And if you make it in there in the evening, uh, the tradition is you go in and you get yourself a cheeseburger. Yeah. Um, I bet. So this a couple, <laughs> this, this year was uh, pretty awesome. So I got in there right at, at sunset. And it was packed, surprisingly. So we actually got our food to go and ate it out on the dock. But I got a a giant bacon cheeseburger and a non-alcoholic beer. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is some semblance of normal. Right. (laughs) How many days had you been going until you get there? That was day four. Um, Day four. Day three. I'd have gotten a um, cheeseburger to go and another cheeseburger to go. I think I would have taken I, one with me. Yeah. I, I, I thought about getting more, but 
after three days of that, I didn't want, I didn't want to have a gut bomb mm. and not be able to sleep. And all of a sudden my system's trying to figure out how to digest all this. Right. <laughs> um, but the biggest, the biggest thing that I concentrate on more so than food is hydration. Um, and when you're paddling and you're using both arms and you're standing up and it, you have to force yourself to take a break and, and hydrate and drink. So you're wearing um, like a camelback or, or some sort of a um, bladder? I had it down on the deck level rather than carrying it on my back and right. put more weight on it for that long. Um, but a longer tube. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also used a tailwind, yeah. which is what yeah, a lot of the stuff. endurance athletes use. Uh -huh. and they I have put some of that water. stuff. It works good, right. doesn't it? And it's, so instead of drinking water, which is no calories, you're actually getting some calories as well. I think it, each one of the little packets that I would put in there was 200 calories. Plus electrolytes, right? You, yes. You're worried about your electrolytes? Yeah. Because, man, um, that... And right. I did I did plan ahead. I took um, a mold every, every morning or sometime during the day when I would forget. But uh, I did take a, a multivitamin. Mm. Um, uh, I started taking some of Jocko's supplements. Yeah. Which um, one? So I, I use the joint warfare. Okay. And so I made sure I was taking that. Um, and then I would take the, the, uh, what's it called? The go. Okay. Um, for mental clarity and that, that helped. Uh, so those mental having, clarity, what does that have in it? Like, um, uh, ginkgo biloba and uh, stuff it, that, it's all natural yeah um but i had tried it and been using it for a year and a half um a lot of guys use they they have it in a powder mix as well mm -hmm. and they use it for a pre-workout yeah so it kind of wakes you up instead of having a cup of coffee i i had that yeah that um, does work i i take that on it product that um rogan's always talking about that sometimes what's it called it's uh it's a, it's a, what is that stuff called? I don't know. It works though. Um, and there's a powder, there's a pill. Um, it's the, it's a brain supplement that makes you, yep. it's, it's supposed to make you, uh, more, more clear and you can feel it. I mean, like there's a, there's a feel like it's not like caffeine, but there's a lift and you can start thinking better. Nootropics is, uh, it's, that's what, what's, what they are. God, why can't I, why can't I think about that on it product, whatever it is. Um, anyway, that, that stuff works and I'm sure Jocko's is, is similar to that. Um, man, so, um, the food seems to be, and, and the electrolytes and the water. So where are you getting your water? Uh, I had with me, I had my Camelback, which is a three liter bladder. Mm -hmm. I had another smaller or a separate three liter bladder. And then I had two four liter bladders. Wow. Uh, and depending on the would stretch, that, would that get you through the whole day? Just what you described there or is oh, that enough for so, a day? That's more than one oh, day. That's worth. plenty. Okay. So roughly, roughly four liters is a gallon mm -hmm. um, for rough measurements. So in my mind, depending on the temperature and stuff like that, I'm thinking a gallon of water a day. Mm -hmm. So at my longest stretch, I might be carrying three or four gallons. Now you're carrying three or four gallons because of the replenishment is, are there certain stations that you get replenished or is a boat coming to try to find you or what, how does that work? No, nope, it's, you're a hundred percent on your own. So there's no support. There's no, there's no replenishment from anything unless you find it. Um, but in the, the, in the beginning of the course, you're paddling through the intercoastal. So there are docks, there are restaurants. Um, the first checkpoints after 62 miles, um, you can replenish your water there. As you go further South, there's still other places. This step-off point 
where you need to make sure that you have plenty of water is before you get into the Everglades or more before you get into the 10,000 islands. Mm. So when you leave, um, when you leave Goodland by Marco Island, your next checkpoint is Chokoloski. Mm -hmm. And so you carry enough water between Goodland and Chokoloski. When you leave Chokoloski, your next water refill station is Flamingo. Right. That's a long so way. You have a hundred miles. <laughs> you have a hundred miles. And even with that 45 miles a day, that's two days. Um, and then if something happens, you want to have some spare. Mm. So from there, that was the only stretch of the race from Chokoloski to Flamingo that I had all my bladders filled. So I had the four, the four, that's eight, um, the three and 11, and then another three, um, 14 liters of water. That's also 32 pounds. Yeah. So it's a balancing act. That's half your weight that you're carrying on your boat, right? Like yep. you, you said, you're carrying around 60, 70 pounds and half of that being water. Right. And as you go further down the course, yeah, your ambient load because you're eating your food, it's getting less. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I left Flamingo, my one bag, I was like, what can I put in this bag <laughs> to support? Uh, because I only had, I had two dry bags. Um, and then I had a deck bag over the one dry bag. Mm. And that was, that was it. And so it, when you start going through your food and towards the end of the race, I planned, I packed six days of food and knowing that I'm probably going to have leftovers each day. Um, so day seven is kind of a smorgasbord, whatever's left I'm eating it mm -hmm. and eating with a purpose. Yeah. Um, so how many times have you done this race? So I did it. This was my third time. So the third time was a charm. The first time I was a little bit in over my head, I had my expectations, what I thought would happen, how I prepared the gear that I had was totally wrong. Okay. And so then you don't finish that one. I did not finish that one. I made it to checkpoint one. And then I made it um, past Sanibel Island, and I kind of got stuck on a beach um, in Bonita Beach, mm -hmm. um, Wiggins Pass, uh, Wiggins State Park area. Yeah, I've been there. There was a front that came through, um, and the 25, 30 mile an hour winds out of the west, mm, and just wow. crashing on the beach. Yeah, that's yeah. the worst conditions, I would imagine. And there's... That section from Wiggins Pass down to Gordon Pass, just above Kiwaden Island on the way to Marco, is the only section of the course where you have to be out in the Gulf mm. because there's no intercoastal With that a runs 25 there. mile an hour west wind. That does not yeah. sound like a good plan for a paddleboard or no. a canoe or a kayak or a surf ski, maybe a sailboat right. would do okay. But I mean, dang, man, that's, that's, that's right. gotta be the worst weather. If it was 25 miles an hour from the East, maybe doable, you know, because uh, you got, you got the, the, the land, um, uh, giving you some lead, but that's, that's wild. So the first one is a weather is a weather problem. Plus you didn't know what you were doing with all your gear. What happens in the second one? This, the second one, Ah, uh, the second one was as COVID was dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I actually did much of the same route as I did last year on this year's race. Yeah. So I, I had a barometer of how I was doing compared to last year. Mm -hmm. Now, last year, I called it quits in Florida Bay. Wow. I was 20 miles from the finish. Wow. So why, why but, would you do that? You're, you're, it seems like you're so close. I mean, 20 miles 
is still a long ass way to go on a paddleboard, but you're, you're, you've completed almost 300 miles. You got we 20 had, miles left. Why did you stop there? Um, part of it was mental. Part of it was the conditions. We had 20 to 25 knot winds out of the due east. So you're going right and, into it. And you spent plenty of times in Florida Bay. Mm -hmm. And Florida Bay can get oh yeah, pretty nasty. Um, and I was in a, a position where I still had a couple miles before I get any shelter from a from one of the islands. So I was 10 miles out of Flamingo just past, and you'll probably be familiar, Rankin Bite. Oh, yeah. And my goal was to get to Crocodile Drag over. And I paddled for 10 hours, and I went 10 miles. Mm. And after a week long of, of grinding, I, I had nothing left in the tank. Mm. And I still had, and this was Friday night, so it was, it just happened to be starting to get dark. Um, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm exhausted. I'm in that they're a little bit deeper water. So I can't reach the bottom mm -hmm. to stake out. So in the shallower water, I could jam my paddle down in the mud, tie off to my paddle and rest mm -hmm. without losing ground. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was in eight feet of water. If I stop paddling, I'm going backwards, giving up whatever I struggled to gain in the first place. Right. And the devil, the devil in my brain took over and said, just call it. <laughs> so when you want to call it, what do you do? Well, and things happen for a reason. So my wife and kids had come down to see me off um, at the start of the race last year and they worked their way down and they had a blast. It was their spring break. Um, and we had a condo in Key Largo that they were staying at. And I used to live in Key Largo. So uh, I knew a bunch of people down there, a buddy of mine, from middle school, we lived together in Key Largo and he still lives, still lives down there. Well, he got in touch with my wife and said, Hey, he's close. Let's go out in the boat and cheer him on. Little did they know that I said, give me the heck off this boat. They went out there to cheer me on. Right. And I was, I saw them as, Oh, that's your lifeline. This is my way out. <laughs> All right. So, so then you, you tap out on that one. I want to, this is why I wanted to, to talk about those two things, because I want to know what you changed this year and what changed, uh, in your gear, your mindset, whatever you did, maybe it was just the conditions. I don't know what, what changed this year that allows you to finish. But it certainly wasn't the conditions. Okay. Overall, I would say this year's conditions, weather-wise, was tougher than last year. Um, I would say what changed this year was, number one, that gut feeling of giving up so close to the finish. I wouldn't change my decision last year, but it still stings. Mm -hmm. um, but then the overall course of how everything went after that race, how that year played out. Now, I'm a career firefighter paramedic. During the race last year is when this whole COVID bomb blew up. Right. I had no idea. My son, an avid basketball player, lives and breathes for basketball. We actually, they stopped at another spot and cheered me on when I cut through a different pass. And they're like, dad, they canceled March Madness. And I'm like, what? I had no idea. 
well, this entire past year, being a paramedic and dealing firsthand with um, COVID patients on a daily basis, the just the overall anxiety of that, the uncertainty. Um, my escape was this race. Hmm. And that's all I thought about, uh, whether it be working out in the gym, going out and paddling, um, tweaking, tweaking the board, coming up with that idea for my rudder, all those changed a bit. Um, but it was just the overall mindset and it, it might seem weird and quirky, but every time I was in the gym, the, the entire workout and put my earbuds in. And I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, Billy Allsbrook. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, motivational speaker. Okay. Um, and has the messages behind that. I would listen to them the entire workout. Nice. And could recite them nonstop. And it's all building up from the inside. Um, and that whole mental capacity. Last year, bef before last year's race, um, I was posting on social media and saying, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. And hey, you can follow me here and there. This year, my mantra was more spend more time grinding and less time talking. Mm -hmm. And I just had unfinished business. Right. So did you have, did you come up with like a clear uh, reason why you wanted to finish and why this was really important to you? I mean, you, you, you speak of the COVID and, and what that was doing to you in your training and you're listening to these motivational messages. Did that resonate with you to where you just have a real clear mission, a real clear purpose of what it is that you're doing and why? Uh, overall, I would say the reason why I undertook this in the first place is yes, it's a personal and me setting a goal. And at, at the time, like, yeah, right. But like a, a, a goal that others would kind of scoff at, like, really, you're going to do this. And I wanted to show my kids that, hey, you can set whatever goal you want. And they call me old. They call me a boomer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming up on 50. Um, but I wanted to show them that, hey, no matter what your age, if you set a goal and you work for it every single day and you put it in the forefront and let that goal carry you to a, a better place, you can accomplish anything. Um, and I wanted to use that as an example for my kids and also share it with other people. Um, that's it. So, I mean, that, that is the, you know, when you get a strong enough, why you can overcome any, how that's what I've, I, I believe. And, and most times when, when you fail or, or whatever, there there wasn't a real strong reason why you wanted to do it in the first place. So you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't come to grips with it real clearly. Um, okay. What, what do you got? This is a note from yourself. So, so these are, uh, when you get into a checkpoint, you sign the book, uh, you have to hit your spot. So they have a electronic electronic signature of what time you were there, but as a backup and a way to remember is you sign the log book. Um, so each checkpoint has one of these books. And so checkpoint two, which is Chocoloski, um, I, I dedicated to my boys, um, Aiden and Tyler. And when things get hard, like this win, Remember, reperio viam, which means find a way, and nole desiste, which means never quit. Nice. Uh, so, 
So on each checkpoint, I dedicated. Um, the first checkpoint, I dedicated to my, my crew at my station. They encouraged me throughout the year and working out and then all healthcare providers. Checkpoint three, I dedicated to my wife because I don't want to sleep on the couch. Um, <laughs> it's more to it been, than that. She's been a rock star um, supporting me along the way and driving me to be better. Um, and the last one, I don't know what happened to my picture, but my last one pretty much sums it up. But I said, checkpoint three is dedicated to the goals and dreams and every bit of work it takes to make them happen. The fifth person ever to finish on a sup. And I said, my brother, Brian rocks. <laughs> nice. nice, man. That is so, so my- awesome. That's powerful, man. That is, that is powerful. Especially like when, when you've got two other races that you did not complete. And this is, this is not an easy thing to do. Um, and then you, you, you know, you, you, you really change your mindset. I'm sure you changed your training. I'm sure you changed your, your gear. I'm sure you changed some of the things that you're eating or, or some of those things, but in your opinion of all the changes you made, would you think that your mindset change or your equipment change, your technical change would be more uh, responsible for for finishing this year. I would hands down. I would say my mental, my mental game. I know when we were when I was on last time. One of your questions you asked me. They're like, "How do you train mentally for this?" Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's a, a difficult question to ask to answer. Um, because there's no blueprint for that. I, I went with what I thought would work. Um, given the circumstances of everything in the past year, I thought, you know what, this isn't any harder than dealing with COVID on a daily basis. Hmm. Um, and this was my release. This was my time to shine. Um, now that we seem to be crawling out from under the, the COVID rock. Um, I'd love to inspire other people to set, set a goal. Mm -hmm. Um, you've had so many different people on, on your podcast who have done amazing things, whether it be hike the, the three main, the trifecta of trails. Um, one of the questions I keep getting from people, they're like, well, what's next? And I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) I have to digest this first. Um, And a lot of it, it doesn't, it hasn't completely hit yet. Um, I got home Monday night, done laundry. I've started to go through some cleaning up gear, Um, but I haven't left the house Mm -hmm. since Monday night when I've gotten home. I go to work back to work tomorrow. Um, so that'll be fun. I get to finally see, (laughs) see folks. Um, and maybe it will sink in a little bit more, but just the overall feeling knowing that in this race, 65, 65 people started it. Only 32 finished it this year of all boats, all craft. All craft. All. Okay. How many people are so, on paddleboard this year? Two. Two. How many people finished? Two. <laughs> two. All right. Well, good um, for the other guy. So, or girl. so my buddy Scott, um, he actually owns Paddle the Florida Keys, Scott based. He is a machine. He does, and he's been a great mentor to me, um, a great person to, to bounce ideas off of. Um, Maybe not from a a physical preparation standpoint, but from a gear standpoint and a planning standpoint, um, he he's amazing. He's one of the five individuals who has finished this on a paddleboard. Mm. Now, 
he also he has finished this four different times. Whoa. So there are there's Scott who has finished it four times. There's Josh Collins, who you've had on the yeah. show. Yeah, he was great. Veteran guest. Boyd's 360. Yeah. Josh has finished it twice. And then there's myself and two other guys. Nice. And that's it. Nice. And I'm not a hundred percent sure of how many people have attempted it, but, but it's a pretty small crew. Yeah. And talking with other people in the water tribe, they're like, uh, I don't know how you guys do it because if you're in a kayak, they're, they're like, it's so grueling and everything. I have no idea how you're doing it on a paddleboard. And my answer is honestly, I, don't know how I'm doing it on a paddleboard either. <laughs> well, do you have anything to compare it to? Have you done something like that in a kayak or or a sailboat or anything like that? I've done some, I've done some sailing. Um, that that buddy of mine that lives in the Keys, mm-hmm. he he built a Bolger light schooner that we we've, we've done uh, the Great Chesapeake Bay schooner race twice. Yeah. Um. And th- those experiences, I, I just like to push myself. Yeah. Um, and for me, knowing that I'm on a paddleboard, it's not the guy that's in front of me on the board that's going to be at fault. There's only one person on the board. So if I don't meet my goal, there's only one person to blame. Yeah. And, and that's me. Uh, the one of the things that was shocking was I was never sore. <laughs> you, you would think, hey, you paddled paddled 300 miles. Your arms have got to be killing you, your back, your shoulders. Uh, muscle soreness was never an issue. Do you think that was your training or or your nutrition or what? Uh, I think it was a lot to do with the hydration level. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my training definitely had something to do with it. Now this year was weird in that I didn't paddle all that much, at least great distances. I would do five miles or 10 miles and that was it. I think the longest I paddled the entire year was 16 miles and that was for a virtual race. Yeah. Now that's actual outdoor on the board in the water paddling that you're talking yep. about. But you're obviously right. doing some dry land training of some sort to to have your body ready to to do this. What are you simulating the paddle board? Because uh, I saw um, something the other day that I thought about you uh, actually before you even. Um, before we, you even sent me the the picture of you finishing, which I was super happy to hear from you, and and congratulations again. I know we that's what we're doing here is congratulating you for this. But Rich Froning is um, he's partnered up with this company or whatever. But it's I don't know if you've seen this thing, but it's like it's about the size of a a toaster, and yes, it's called I, I know a what you're whipper say. or something yep. or something like that. But I mean, I it looks like that. a cheap rower. But I, anyway, you can take this thing with you traveling. You can hook it on the yep. door. You can hook it wherever. And this isn't a, an advertisement. But one of the things that I noticed was that it had an attachment that you could have a paddle. And you're standing there paddling exactly like you're doing on a paddle board, which I've got the concept to ski erg. In fact, we did that this morning for 40 minutes. Um, and that's good, but it's not the same motion. Like it's, it's definitely not the same motion. And that, that thing looked like it would be awesome. I, I did see that. And, and that does look awesome. Um, what, what were you doing though? Almost every single shift and uh, multiple times during the day. So we have a nice, a, a nice equipped gym at the firehouse. Um, and part of my workout is using one of the weight pulley machines Mm -hmm. and set it at a height and using one arm at a time while standing on a BOSU ball, 
So I'm just standing on the BOSU balls enough balance work right. and work those micro muscles. Um, but then almost everything I'm doing was mimicking some kind of paddle, but with the idea of, I don't want to do too much and do get an overuse injury. Mm. So anytime I'm pulling, I'm devising something where I'm also pushing. Yeah. So I'm working both sides of the muscles. Nice. Um, last year before my race, I got, um, tennis elbow real bad. Mm -hmm. And I had, it wasn't acupuncture, but it's, um, uh, dry needling. Yeah. And I, I mean, I had 35 needles <laughs> in my arm and then electricity going between them. It worked awesome. Um, and I was able to, my arm didn't hurt at all after that, mm. but that was from an overuse injury. Right. Um, so I, I wanted to develop in my workouts, uh, the same muscle groups that I'm going to be using, but also the complementary muscles. Mm. Um, I did a lot of kettlebell stuff. Um, but each workout and then a, a huge component is, is your core muscles. Yeah. Um, I used to have a sore back after paddling a bunch when I worked on my abs more, you would think, okay, if your back's sore, then you work on your back. No, you work on your abs and your abs are the strength to take that stress away from your back. Right. So you changed um, a lot of that stuff this year too, like the, the way that you were training. The, yep. Oh, that's cool. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely interested in that, but I don't want to run out of time. I want you to describe to me what the feeling was after trying this three times. You have tremendous why of, of what you're trying to do that's driving you to do this. You've trained. You've had a tough year, as we all did. What, what did it feel like to cross the finish line? Uh, just a, a wave of emotion that uh, I would say the, the last half mile paddling into the beach was difficult to, I, I couldn't really see through the tears <laughs> coming um, through my eyes, but finally reaching the beach. So I, I was hoping to finish on Friday. And the weather just wasn't happening. Uh, and I took a roundabout way because I couldn't get east. So I went south and then used some islands to get east, which left my last section to the beach north. And it just so happened that the wind clocked around to the northeast. So I had a little bit more headwind. Mm -hmm. Um but when I hit Baker's cut and it's a straight line in, I got about a mile from the beach and Scott base conquistador actually paddled out to escort me in and just the emotions, knowing how hard I've worked to get to the beach for three years was just overwhelming. Um, I do have nice. So I hit the beach, a bunch of fish bump, fist bumps, and then put my head down in the sand. Um, that that lady is. Paula Martell. Um, she is our race mom. She's the race coordinator. She is amazing. Um, any questions that you have throughout the year? Um, and she was always cheering me on, always encouraging me. Um, so it seemed fitting that I got the, a hug and a congratulatory smooch on the cheek. Um, <laughs> From her, um, 
My brother was my support person. He followed me down the coast in case something went wrong. Um, also got my car from Fort DeSoto mm-hmm. down to Key Largo. And he camped along the way. Let's see. There we go. Nice. So your brother's on the dock right there with his hands raised. Uh, the guy in the guy with his hands raised, that's actually my buddy from middle school. Okay. So he was there. Um, I think my brother took this picture. Um, but the award ceremony for this whole race is at 10 o'clock on Saturday. Even though you have until 7 a.m. on Sunday to finish, most people finish in the other vessels they finish on tuesday wednesday thursday and then they're hanging out (laughs) um and so they have the awards and then typically everybody leaves and then well this was at 11 o'clock this was just as the award ceremony was ending (laughs) so everybody was still there and i got such the welcoming committee from the dock um and once I hit the beach, so it was, uh, I kind of wanted to interrupt the, the <laughs> award ceremony. Yeah, I bet. So that's awesome, man. They, they just extended it out. They just hand you your hand to your, they probably don't even give you anything for that. It's like, well, oh, way to go. What do you get a medal? do you get anything? It seems like the things uh, that mean the most almost have the least, uh, the least reward sometimes. So oh, you, you get, get that paddle. little paddle. You couldn't paddle any paddle. kind of boat with that. It's purely <laughs> decorative. <laughs> um, but the other the other thing you get is you get a shark's tooth necklace. Nice. Um, and, and the neat thing is when you before the race at the pre race meetings or afterward, you'll see the guys that have been doing this race for 10, 12 years. And they'll have 10 or 12 of these sharks to Wow. Now, if you do go through the wilderness waterway in the Everglades and you go through the nightmare, which is a incredibly narrow canopied over section, mm. which can be confusing and mosquito and no ridden section. You make it through the nightmare and finish. You also get an alligator tooth. Mm. Um, to go with it. So it is cool seeing some of the, the more veteran tribe members um, that have finished 10, 12, 15 challenges. And they're just all these shells. And I thought about just getting two blank ones, which would represent my two previous mm-hmm. Everglades challenges yeah. where I have nothing to show for them. But now I have this one. So <laughs> Well, that's it's awesome, pretty awesome. Man. That's that's um, that's terrific. So I I really like the you know the fact that you know you you do this and you have to do it twice before you complete it a third time. I mean that that shows so much. It shows that it re- actually means something to you then you you know the first one you show up you're like, "Whoa, I I didn't know what I was doing." You change some things on the second one, but still you 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 your mind's not right things are different and then you change significantly a lot of the things that you're doing both in your training, but in in your mindset. So, and and then you finish. And so that's a, that's an awesome story in itself. But what, what has been the most important to me on finishing events that meant something to me, like this one means to you is a perspective change in my life have you had enough time to digest this at all to, to kind of reevaluate some of the things? I mean, did you, you, you perceived limits, ways that you set goals? I don't know what it is for you, but have you had a time, have you had enough time to kind of digest to, to experience a, pers- a perspective change and, and how you might move forward from here? Uh, I would, I would actually say that, rather than 
changing my perspective, it's cemented mm. my perspective. Um, and yeah, this, this past year, this pandemic has been absolutely horrible. Um, I noted, noticed a change in my mindset and that was the end of December when I got my first vax, my first dose of the vaccine. Mm. All of a sudden the weight was lifting off my shoulder. Uh, I tried up until then, instead of look at the negatives, because whether it be the pandemic, the political arena, whatever, there's so much negativity in the world. And rather than dwell in that world, I wanted to inspire people and look beyond that small little world of negativity and be positive. Um, and that's, that's what I was trying to do. And it's, it's amazing. Um, through the posts and social media, there are all sorts of people and that's, it's sort of like a video game mm -hmm. for people at home, dot watchers. My brother would update them. My wife would update. Um, occasionally I would do a Facebook live. Um, I updated on my Instagram and just the reach of how many people were actually paying attention. Um, and the message of some of encouragement, the messages saying, Hey, you're inspiring me. I, I want to do this hmm. or I want to do something similar to this. I just have to figure out what it is. I don't know if I'm going to paddle 300 miles, but if it gives them enough courage to sit there and go, you know what? I I've never run anything. I want to sign up for a 5k race. Right. I want to sign up for a 10k. My first half marathon or a marathon, a swim, who knows? I don't, it, right. it doesn't matter to me. It, it needs to matter to that person. Right. And so if, let's, let's stop there for a second. If, if you do inspire people to do that and then they are to ask you some advice and just like you say, it doesn't matter what it is. It's something that means something to them. It could be a 5k race. It could be going back to school. It could be, I don't know, being a better parent. It could be whatever it is for that person. You've inspired them now to, get off the couch, make a change, whatever that is, tackle this challenge. What's the advice that you'd give somebody? Uh, my advice is you have to change as a whole. Um, and it's not just one aspect because everything is tied together. And so you, the most important thing is to find balance. Uh, so many times in life you put, a hundred percent effort in one aspect, it's got to come from somewhere else. Um, so yeah, you could be performing at the highest level in one area, but what's the cost where, what other areas of your life are being robbed of that? Um, so you may not have to be tops, if you're the next level down, that brings another aspect, whether it be my training going out for four hours versus eight hours, or do I get a chance to work drills with my son, which makes him happy? Doing housework, cleaning up around the house, at work. Um, signing up for overtime versus not signing up for overtime, um, spending time on the trampoline with my younger son, oh, all these things, there's a balance and you have to find that balance. And that makes all the difference in the world. And whether it took me the three years or two and a half years to find a balance saying, Hey, I'm working my butt off during my time, but that other time 
I'm giving back to my family. I'm, I'm making myself a hundred percent available to them rather than being not present and Mm -hmm. still thinking for myself. And and that's, that's the biggest thing is, is finding that balance for me. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do that because, um, you know, you want abundance in every area of your life. You don't want, you don't want to be a superstar in one area and everything else falling apart. Cause that's, I mean, there are people that like that, you know, they do so well in business and then their relationships fall apart. Their, their friendships fall apart. Their, everything falls apart. And then, you know, but they're a superstar in, in one area. That's right. that only take you so far. you to be a superstar so a, in every area. You have a goal for one. You should have a goal for the others. And as you're achieving the goal for whatever, whether it be an athletic thing or something else, you're also working at other goals in your relationships, yeah. um, in your job, in your home life. Um, and there are that. ways too, though. I would, I, I would imagine that you would uh, agree. There are ways that you can take on something like this and it can be an enhancement to so many of the other areas of your life rather than a detriment, like the time that you train, the, the, focus that you're putting into it and the focus that you're like, you're you're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to train, but it's also important to remember those people that are around you that are having to deal with your training. And it is your training. It's not their training. Like you don't want it to be a pain in everybody's neck all the time. But yeah, if you can figure out a way for it to be an enhancement, that's what I tell people all the time with, with, uh, if, if they ask about like working out, like, how do I get in shape? It's like, well, it would be super awesome if you enjoyed what you were doing and it would be even more awesome. And if it was sustainable so that you're doing it at a time that you're not taken away from your family, it, that you're doing exactly. it at a time that, that, that this is making you a better person. It's making you, it's giving you a better relationship rather than trying to do it at dinner time every night. Where's dad? Oh, he's running. You know, it's right. like, that's never going to work. It's just not going to work, but you have to have the, the forethought to kind of, It's not even prioritizing it. It's just organizing it. Like it's still that important. It's just better done at another time of the day. And you've said it on your podcast and I, and I, I, I took that to heart. So if I want to work out, it's not going to be when I get to spend that little bit of time with my kids before or after school. Right. It's going to inconvenience me to get up earlier and work out utilize that time that nothing else is going on. And then when I have time to spend with my kids or the rare time I actually get to spend quiet time with my wife without the kids around, then I'm not stuck doing something else. Right. Yeah. That's that's, important, man. That's good advice. Well, you know, um, it's, it's so awesome to, f- that you finished it. But I think that, you know, for me, who've, I've, I've experienced failure and success, uh, in athletic endeavors and business endeavors and lots of other endeavors. And it makes it all that much sweeter when, when the success that you've had or, or that you finally do experience, uh, there's, there's some failure involved in it. Whoa. What's that? You sleeping? Yeah, that was I'm just flipping through a couple of pictures, (laughs) you know, but when there's failure involved and you overcome that failure, you, you alter what you're doing and that, that, uh, ultimately results in success. That is, that makes it all the much sweeter. And it sounds like that's where, where you are right there. So you got two, um, on this picture that you're, you've got up here right now, it's your, your board on a beach with a tarp over the top of it. And you have well, two, you have two, um, things holding up the tarp. What are those things? Is that a paddle so and a spare paddles. paddle? Okay. That's my paddle and my spare paddle. Okay, yeah. Okay. Cool. And this is, it, while it looks like a beach, <laughs> that's mud. Yeah. That might be mud <laughs> and low tide. <laughs> <laughs> there is no firm ground there. Yeah. What a, what a, uh, uh, a really wild unforgiving area the Everglades are. I mean, what was the, Oh, that looks like you could sink up to your neck in that. That's the famous Chocoloski mud. 
Dang. <laughs> and when you get off your board, how, how, how deep do you sink? Uh, almost up to your knee. <laughs> so you're not going to walk in through that very far. Like, uh, you know, you walk a hundred yards in that, that's your heart rate will be at 187, and, uh, and you don't have any shoes anymore. Um, that's, that looks like a very unforgiving place. Or did you encounter a lot of mosquitoes? Obviously. <laughs> um, some, some, not, not much. I did pull out my thermosel for, for a little bit. Flies. No. No flies. no flies. I mean, Mosquitoes is that part of the no reason seams. why that, I mean, I, I think about the time that they're having this, this race and it's like, man, there's a lot of bad weather you could encounter this time of the year. Um, but on the other hand, if you put it off until June, I don't know that anyone would survive the mosquitoes. Is that why it is set at this time of the year? Uh, I would say that's part of it. And the other part of it, may have to do with the organizer's insurance, whether they'd be able to do it during hurricane season. Oh, because hurricane I, season starts April 1st. I tell you, man, I think I would rather take on a hurricane on a paddleboard than those mosquitoes in the nightmare. That would yep. be, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I believe that you would need a blood transfusion if you even made it out of there. I mean, I have gone too close to an island in the middle of the summertime and in a skiff with a, with a, with a, a 90 horsepower motor and <laughs> you can't get away from them. They get under the gunnels, and then you stop, and then here's this black cloud again. Those are the worst mosquitoes I've ever seen uh, around where you are, Flamingo, all that area. Flamingo to Chukaluski. There's no spraying. There's, there's, is that your little backpack tent? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's yes. a real tent. Like, that's... Yeah. I, I thought you were in one of these, like, super really things that just barely covers your face with a with a hole but that's like that's like a real tent you could sit up in that. that's a legit tent yeah that's yeah, cool they're awesome and one of the things like the gear that i i chose to use um when i can is i'll find a company that also has a program to give back um to stuff and i found this company um and they make donations for for everything they sell they make donations back um, to the less fortunate. Um, so that's a hike and bike tent. Um, the, my dry bags The I didn't, I didn't have a huge budget. Um, and I went looking for a dry duffel bag mm -hmm. with a zipper instead of the roll tops. Um, and I just happened to find this company and I thought I'd be slick. And I sent him an email and said, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to sponsor me and everything, basically looking for a discount or something like that, a pro, a pro deal. And I get an email back from the owner of the company. He goes, we're not as big as you think we are. <laughs> this company is me. And my wife, and then a couple of buddies who helped to get some orders out from time to time. And that's it. And I was like, you just earned my business. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Then I'll buy one. So, and, and it's a veteran-owned company. So oh, right I was on. like, awesome, giving back to him. So, so Jeff, the owner of the company, Jeff at Rugged, he's fantastic. Nice. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, uh, congratulations on this. It's, uh, it's an inspiring motivational story and, and, uh, I have no doubt that you're going to inspire a lot of people to do whatever it is. It's in interesting to them or important to them. And, uh, it doesn't have to be a 300 mile race through the Everglades. It doesn't have to be a marathon. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, swim around Key West. It could be anything, 5k, a walk. A daily Absolutely. walk. Absolutely. Anything. But uh, you're going to do it. And I appreciate it, man. This is a good story. And congratulations. I, I'm really proud Thanks, of Tom. you, man. That's a, that's a big accomplishment. And uh, it's going to go a long way to uh, showing that your kids, showing your kids that they can do anything that they want. And that's, I think that was the, I think that was the purpose. That's my goal. All right. Well, Mike, I appreciate it. When you, when you decide you're going to do something else, let's get back on the podcast again. We'll talk about whatever that is. Cause I'm, I'm pretty sure this isn't going to be the last, uh, challenge right. that you do. What, 
Whatever happened to the skiff challenge? <laughs> the skiff challenge got ca- canceled last year and right. then got rescheduled this year at a time that I'm it's... not able to do it. So oh, not, okay. not going to be participating in it, but uh, there's a, there's well, another back challenge. Probably helps. Well, your back's it, probably happy back's about that. thanking me right now, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a tough one. It will go on without me. And, uh, and there's some hardy souls out there that are going to take on the challenge. Um, awesome. So anyway, we'll, we'll well, check in on that. I'll be rolling out, uh, some footage and pictures and stuff like that. Tell people where they can find that. Sure. It's a Chesapeake T jam. So it's Chesapeake, uh, like the water Mm -hmm. body and then T J A M, which is stands for Tyler, Julie, Aiden, and Mike. Nice. So you didn't tell me that last time. I don't think. Yep. I always just wondered so kind of what T Jam was. Everybody's like Toe Jam. No, <laughs> no, it's it's T Jam. So, right on. Yeah, it works out well. All right. Well, go follow him there and uh, check out all this footage. And um, good job, man. Congratulations. Nice to catch awesome, up with you, Tom. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you. It's been great. See ya. 